Nadia Musaji. We were lucky enough to be introduced to Nadia by Raul Balaños, who studied with her in Stuttgart, Germany. Raul knew that we would connect with Nadia through her tremendous work promoting women and diversity in general and technology and be inspired by her many accomplishments. So Nadia has worked across 26 countries to revolutionize the face of engineering through diversity, inclusion, innovation, entrepreneurship, and education, leaving no one behind in a tech-enabled future. She's passionate about cybersecurity, equitable technology, fostering prosperity in emerging economies, and engineering better societies. Based in South Africa, Nadia is a serial entrepreneur by passion and an engineer by training. Notably, Nadia is the co-founder of WAM Hub and WAM Eng. WAM Hub is dedicated to supporting high growth female founders in creating more inclusive technology for the future and is responsible for building the first female founder innovation space in Africa. WAM Eng is a global social enterprise developing women and girls for engineering and tech. Nadia is also the recipient of multiple awards and honors and holds several board seats and council positions. The list is very, very long. So um, it's, it's impressive and I invite you all to go online and take a look. Today, Nadia will talk about the importance of DEI not only on the talent side, by enabling us all to bring our authentic selves to the work we do, but also on the client side, where innovation is fueled through the creativity and diverse perspectives we can bring to how we solve for our clients' challenges in the digital world. I can't think of a more appropriate speaker for us. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nadia. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Lynn, and for, for the generous introduction and um, good day. Hi, hello, um, hola, um, um, merhaba. You know, we could go on and on in all the, in all the different languages uh, just to, to say hello to everybody. And thank you so much to, um, to um, the Wiseline team for having me this kind of whatever time zone you're in. Um, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. This is really a passion area of mine to be able to talk about diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and so please uh, feel free to, um, you know, pop questions in the chat um, or, you know, the, this whole kind of virtual world that we that we live in is always kind of a, a really hard one to to navigate, even though we've been doing it for the last two years. Um, but it's still not part of muscle memory, right? Um, and so, you know, that uh, that still takes a little bit of time. Um, but I'm, I've, I've got a deck that I'm going to go through. I'm going to be speaking through some of the really key pieces around um, using diversity, equity, and inclusion to actually build high performance teams to support innovation. Um, and actually, how we've been doing this work for a very long time. I've been personally doing this work for 17 years. Um, and really still now getting traction around getting people on board around the agenda around diversity, equity, inclusion, and the why this is important um, for, for various different reasons. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, you know, if, if there is a, a, a technical term that I use, because I know that there's a lot of jargon in everybody's industries. And so if there is a, a technical term that you just like, what does that even mean? Um, you know, please just do uh, um, stop me and I know, uh, we always say we love the TLAs, the three letter acronyms for everything. So if you if you see a couple of those as well and you're just like, what does that mean? Um, please don't just sit there in, in wonder. Uh, please just do, uh, you know, pop it into the chat as well. And, and I'm, I'm happy to provide some clarity as well. Right? Um, and so just really, you know, talking about, you know, the work that we've been doing, it's really around how do we develop a diverse and inclusive workforce through engineering and technology. And, you know, um, we've been speaking more and more around how this idea around engineering and engineering our worlds is really stretched from, you know, the traditional terminology around um, what an engineer is, what an engineer does. And so we find ourselves in so many different spaces, engineering different things um, and different roles in which we have. Um, and so, you know, 
for us, it's been a real pleasure to be able to actually get the industry on board and understand what this looks like for us um, and for our clients and partners. Um, and so really for us, it's not just about, um, you know, a snapshot in, in, in the value chain around our industry, but it's really around how is it that we build an entire ecosystem to revolutionize the face of the uh, of our sector. Um, and so just very quickly, you know, the work that we've been doing to be able to build it and, and some of the, the lessons learned that I've, I've going to be talking about today and some of the, the how to um, is really because we've built this value chain from attraction to ownership, right? So you start to see a lot of programs at the beginning of a pipeline to get more people excited about engineering and tech careers to change the PR um, of engineering um, and, and tech um, and getting more young people excited about it, getting more elderly people excited about it as well, right? And so getting that whole spectrum involved. Um, we work with university students as well um, to be able to help them transition their skills um, into skills of the future and looking at really the bottlenecks um, around um, sometimes we come out knowing you know very much technically sound applications but actually it's really around how do we operate in a multicultural world um, and I think that really is going to be one of the core skills of the future, right? And so uh, what we start to see is, you know, um, these global entities moving in different directions. You're seeing that, you know, talent being able to um, move anywhere and can work for anyone, right? And so suddenly you're not only thinking about how do I attract skills into my own company, but how is it that I can attract skills from anywhere and I can attract the best skills. Um, we work on leadership and really getting leadership on board around thinking about uh, diversity, equity and inclusion in different ways and thinking about the transformation agenda. Um, and actually at the board level, this is one of the things that boards most discuss, actually it's the third most discussed point is thinking about transformation uh, within companies, um, understanding this idea of, you know, global talent pools and um, thinking about um, workforces of the future as well as the present. Um, and making sure that they're not disrupted because they uh, one not just about the technology that has come in, but also that the talent that has exited, right? Um, why female-led innovation and, and why we're so focused on, on this is because it really has been an underserved market and an opportunity. Um, women control 80% of the household purchasing power around the world. Uh, women have the power to be able to eradicate industries. And I'll talk a little bit about that later and think about really what is the power of your consumer um, and women as a powerful consumer force um, and, and thinking about that as your customer and uh, making sure that you're able to align your innovation to what your customer needs are. And then, you know, some of the work that we've been doing really around spaces for, for women, so actual physical spaces. Um, and so we, we are building a, a hub in, uh, we've got one in uh, Johannesburg, we are building an innovation hub in Cape Town, uh, one in Namibia in Vintuk and one in, in Kenya in Nairobi, um, as we start to create physical spaces and opportunities for, uh, for women to connect, um, cultivate their networks and convert that from an entrepreneurship perspective. Um, and really around how is it that we make sure that um, we unlock this idea of an economy where uh, actually when you start to invest in women, you get um, a higher return on investment, right? So at an entrepreneur level, but also as a, a from a talent perspective. Um, so that's what we do. Um, and so, you know, I'm a big uh, superhero uh, nut. Um, I will I may or may not drop a couple of Marvel references here. So if there is something, um, you know, please just uh, do bear with me um, as I, I may do some Avengers references and I apologize in advance. It's the, uh, the tech in me that is just, um, uh, I just can't help myself. Um, but really it's about how is it that we actually create these superheroes, right? How do we create these high performing teams and how does it give us the competitive edge, right? Um, and in, in a world where the bottom line is becoming more and more imperative globally, where shareholders' demands are becoming even more demanding, when the economies have shifted based on two years of COVID, where we've gotten some, you know, really incredible winners and some really sad losers in the process of economic development and growth um, and stunting and growing and industries kind of massively shifting overnight, right? How is it that we can create that competitive edge um, both for us and how is it that we can create almost a futuristic outlook around talent, but also around economic opportunity um, and economic and opportunity for growth as a business. Um, and so just to get us all um, uh, aligned on uh, on just 
framing and, and terminology. Um, and I always think that this is always the best way to describe, um, you know, the work that we do around diversity, equity and inclusion, right? Diversity is really around being invited to the party, right? And everybody gets to be invited to the party. Um, and more and more what we're starting to see is that, um, you know, companies, they take this really seriously. It is one of the uh, performance indicators of businesses um, for teams, uh, and that is how diverse it is, because the consumer is becoming unforgiving, right? Especially because we've got more um, in tune millennials and Gen Zs who are looking for companies that and, and holding them to a standard that is higher than uh, than previous. And that's just because we live in such an interconnected world that is really driven by social media um, and, and media in a different way and, and, and technology. Right. And so, um, you know, they have to be more diverse, right? Um, but inclusion is something completely different. Um, and inclusion is really about, you know, being asked to dance and why this discussion is so important, but so difficult is because diversity, you can see, right? On the, on the surface, we all look the same or we look different, right? So we're either diverse or we're not, right? Um, and, um, and it's really linked to kind of the identity, right? And so we can have a room full of people, they look and, you know, feel different from a shapes and colors perspective, um, uh, from an orientation perspective, it could be cognitive in that they, you know, they think very differently um, and they come with different perspectives. They come from different backgrounds. I'm sure on this call, we've got quite a diverse uh, um, representation here. But inclusion is something a little bit harder to measure, right? There isn't a box for it that you can take, uh, you know, on, on a form. And it's really, you know, um, can people feel like they bring their full selves to work, right? Um, and that not just that, that they have their voices heard. Um, and in the work that we do, you know, companies are really focused on the diversity agenda. They, they want to hire talent that is really diverse. And then when they come into businesses, they're like, I'm sorry, but we've been doing this for the last 15 years in this particular way. Um, you know, this is the standard operating procedures that we have. So no new ideas. And so you're hiring people and talent for new ideas, for innovative thinking. But actually, no, when you come into the business, you've got to think the way we all think. Right. Um, and so, yes, your company is diverse. No, you're not inclusive. Right. Um, and so that is some of the challenges that companies are facing today, right? Because you're hiring this and it's, and, you know, it's such a kind of a travesty because you're spending so much time hiring people that are different because you want them to come with different ideas and then actually, no, you really just want them to think like you do. Um, uh, and, and because that's the corporate strategy. Um, and so it's really around how is it that we make sure that we're able to bring, you know, our full selves um, in, in the work that we do um, and helping companies to see the value add of both being diverse, but also more importantly, being included, included, right? And um, and so just kind of the sales pitch around why this is important is what we're seeing more and more is you're seeing, you know, increased productivity, um, you're seeing um, lots of different creativity because people are coming from different backgrounds. So they see a solution in a completely different way. Um, they're seeing increased profitability. And, you know, before when I used to talk about diversity and inclusion, um, everybody used to talk about the, the equality piece, right? Um, or the equity piece that around fairness, right? And they say, you know, we've got to have a diverse organization because it's representative of the world in which we operate in. Um, and so that is why. So they went on the fair discussion. And what we started to see over time, uh, and, and I kind of did a keynote for, for an organization with, um, at a conference where they had all the, CEOs, the chief, it was just when they were launching the chief innovation officer title. So everybody, because every company had to be innovative. So you have to have a chief innovation officer title. Um, and they had the chief marketing officers in the room, right? Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I was the gender speaker because everybody was like, oh, you know, we need to have one woman speaker at this conference. And so that was me. Um, and they said, you need to speak about, you know, the woman thing. And I said, okay, cool. Um, uh, let me speak about the woman thing and then I hijacked the conversation and I said, you know, a very simple question to the room. Um, how, how many of you, and because the room was like 99% men, how many of you say you don't understand women? Right. And so, you know, every almost every guy put up their hand. Um, there was, you know, you always get the class clowns in the in the room. And so some guys put up two hands. Um, and, you know, when I you look around and I said, you know, CEOs um, look around because fundamentally we have a business problem. 
um, because you're trying to tell me that you fundamentally don't understand 50% of the population that controls 80% of your household purchasing power, right? That's a business challenge, right? And all that's going to happen is, is that what I'm going to be doing is investing in a ton of women entrepreneurs. Um, they are going to be able to design better products and services to speak to me as a consumer, and I'm going to take away your market share. And so, sad, and, I'm, and so suddenly I had all these CEOs going, oh my goodness, <laughs> we need to start to hire more women. Nadia, where do I get more women from? <laughs> right? um, especially at the engineering design table. And I, I had a CEO come to me and say to me, Nadia, you know, I've been coming to this conference um, and nobody has articulated the need for diversity, equity and inclusion like you have. Everybody has spoken about you know, equity and I understand equity and I understand equality and I understand fairness and the right thing to do, but actually there's no business imperative there. And ultimately I've got to account to my shareholders um, and they don't really, you know, fairness is fairness, but actually do we live in a very fair world? No, we live in a world that is unfortunately driven by the bottom line, right? And so, you know, you're now telling me directly that my bottom line is going to be affected if I actually hire more women or if I don't, um, if I have diverse teams or I don't. And that to me makes a lot more business sense, right? And so suddenly we've changed the conversation entirely from this is important because it's fair to this is important because you need to make more money, right? Um, and there are other benefits, right? So you're starting to see that, you know, Company reputation, you, as I said before, we live in a very interconnected world where company reputation is um, can be made or broken on social media over very small incidents, right? And you've got kind of keyboard warriors that will take you to task, um, especially if you start to see kind of the gender washing piece, um, etc. The other thing is, is that in a world of skills, you know, skill sets and, and, and a scarcity of skills, we can't start to ignore people out there who have that particular skills, but may not necessarily look like you, um, think like you or act like you, right? And so what you're doing is is, is actually um, decreasing the, the opportunity for your company and your organizations, right? And then the last thing is around, really around improving insights. And especially as you know, you want to be in a global business, right? If you are in a global business, it makes so much more sense to be able to have a representative workforce. It helps you get into countries faster. It helps you to understand product market fit much quicker. And I'll give you a very quick example of this. Um, we've worked, one of our clients was one of the largest FMCG companies in the world. Um, and they decided that they were going to go and, um, uh, you know, they make teas, they make spices, they make all sorts of things. Um, and they were going into Brazil and they were going to sell tea. You know, they, they were going to move their tea business into Brazil. And they spent a fortune trying to get people in Brazil to drink tea. But if you know anything about Brazilians, they love their coffee, right? And so how is it that you're able to try change consumer behavior overnight? You can't, right? Unless you've got something like COVID. And even with COVID, you couldn't change consumer behavior overnight, right? And we've learned this about masks and about vaccines and all sorts of things, right? Um, and the company lost millions of dollars. And all that was needed was some of, you know, people in the company to go, guys, Brazilians will not drink tea necessarily. We are coffee drinkers, right? And so unless you're willing to spend money on advertising and branding and trying to get consumers to change behavior, which really is, you know, an uphill battle in itself, um, let's not, and if you've got that runaway to be able to burn that kind of money, great, let's do that, right? But actually let's understand what, you know, what user behavior is and, and, and let's make sure that our products are now fit, right? And, you know, they may never drink tea in, in Brazil as much as they, uh, that you like, but maybe we must go niche, we must go on, you know, the properties of how tea is similar to coffee, right? If you want to sell tea there, let's, let's talk about that tea has higher caffeine than, than coffee does. Let's make sure that they understand the value add and why it's so similar, right? Or is it just a taste thing? And so they're spending billions and you're wasting billions um, when actually all you needed was some local insight and local opportunity right um, and so these are the really why you know the, the business imperative is really there um, and and what we're starting to see more and more and people go Nadia what does this feel like right um, uh, when I what is it uh, when I look at a diverse and inclusive company what does that feel like and really it's it's about the 
ability to have recognition, right? That recognition that everybody is different, um, that we come with different backgrounds, different cultures, different festivities, but that all of it can be celebrated, right? And that we respect our differences. And it's really hard because you sometimes don't know this. You don't know what you don't know. And we call this unconscious bias, right? And we all have it. Every single one of us are, are biased in, in a particular way. You know, I, um, I, when I was studying in Germany, I had, uh, there was a big Mexican, uh, you know, delegation from uh, University of Guadalajara. And I was just like, I thought all Mexicans play the guitar. I'm really sorry that it was a stereotype. I just had this in my head, right? Um, and, and that was just a bias that I had. It was, you know, may have been a positive. And I also thought that all of them salsa dance, they don't. Uh, let me just say that. So, um, uh, and so it's understanding that we do have differences, respecting that, um, understanding that we all have biases, um, but being able to understand it and bring conversations, constructive conversations into the environment. Um, and really making sure that people are included so that they can actually contribute, right? So that people aren't feeling shy or feeling sad to say that, Nadia, actually, I'm a Mexican and I don't play the guitar or salsa dance. In fact, I hate dancing. I've got two left feet, right? Um, uh, and actually, I'm tone deaf as well, so definitely no music instruments in there. Um, and, and that's the whole idea here is, is that we celebrate what people can bring into, into their environment, no matter what they do. Um, and so, you know, um, it's... And, and I love this quote by, by, by Prime Minister Trudeau, who had the absolute pleasure of, of meeting once, where it's really, you know, diversity is really the engine that is really improves the creativity, it really enriches the world in which we operate in. Um, and, and you're starting to see this more and more, you're starting to see this at a global stage, right? Because again, we, we, know, we don't live in our silos, we don't, we're now interconnected in a way that is unprecedented and will continue to be interconnected in ways in, that are weird and wonderful going forward, right? And so when we start to say not just, um, you know, the boundaries of land and, and the borders that were drawn no longer exist in, in a metaverse, for example, right? What does that look like when actually we become citizens of a world rather than citizens of a particular nation that that was drawn with arbitrary boundary lines, right? And so what does that enriched world look like? And I think that's probably what's so exciting about the tech industry is because they don't see these boundaries um, that, that are, are, are technically man-made. Um, and so, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, diversity and again, the bottom line, we're starting to see that from a revenue perspective, right? You're starting to see that, um, and, and this is market insights that McKinsey has, has released, but, you know, to be able to say that your company is doing so much better than the competitor because you are diverse um, is, and it's something quite simple, right? It's, it's, it's looking at your talent, it's looking at what your pipeline looks like and going, hey, if I have more different people coming in who are able to contribute as their full selves, they can come in and bring the ideas, they can tell you straight up, hey guys, Brazilians, if they're not tea, if they're not tea drinkers, they're coffee drinkers, you know, we're going to be wasting less, uh, but actually let's go in with a coffee product into the market that is quite different. Um, or let's go to a, a, a tea coffee like substitute or something else, right? Just be able to kind of think about new innovation um, in very much contextual um, within within the, the customer base that you're looking for. Um, and diversity is at every level, right? And, and what's really important is that you have it at your senior leadership level, at your board level. Um, you're starting to see it um, at, you know, at shop floor, literally to, to boardroom. What's more important here is that what we're seeing more and more is that um, it can't just be window dressing, right? And so we start, we're seeing a lot of gender washing, just like we're seeing a lot of green washing in the space. When you have gender washing um, and, you know, uh, diversity washing, right, it's, it's that, you know, that picture that everybody looks great on the surface, it looks so diverse, we've got such a colorful team, but actually when nobody's included, you're not going to actually see this and then they go, oh, but we hired this woman and she didn't do a great job, we don't see the innovation, we don't see the 73% higher revenue, right? And then you've got to go and go, why am I not seeing the 73% higher revenues? Because you've got the face of your company looking really amazing, but actually it's the old guard that are gatekeeping opportunity to innovate. Um, and that's a really interesting, you know, in itself, because it means that culturally from your company perspective, it means you've got these gatekeepers and you've got these bottlenecks. And that's going to uh, make sure that you actually don't progress as fast as your competitors do um, in the market. 
um, and so I, I speak a lot about gender, and that's just because that is my my area of speciality. Um, you know, and uh, so Christine Lagarde is the ex um, uh, uh, head of the IMF. Uh, was like, you know, we need an, you know, and because this is also a very tech group, uh, you know, the Internet of Things. Let's move to an Internet uh, of Women, right? And and the reason being is. Uh, you know, the focus on diversity and inclusion, but specifically on gender, is a quick win, right? Um, because what we're seeing is, is that women have such a massive purchasing power. Um, and more and more what we're starting to see is the rise of the middle uh, class. We're starting to see women with more disposable income. We're seeing women have a lot more different purchasing power. Um, and we're starting to see very slowly the emergence of you know changes at board level, changes at leadership level, changes at country level. Um, but you still have the challenge of how is it that it's being accepted. And I, actually, this morning a friend of mine sent me a YouTube video of um, the the Prime Minister of uh, uh, New Zealand and uh, Sweden, who both happen to be women. Um, and one of the journalists asked. Um, did you meet because uh, you know you are similar ages and you're both women? And they said, uh, you know, and I love you know a prime minister Dan, and she said, no, we, we met because we're prime ministers, right? <laughs> and so you know, <laughs> it's the most ridiculous question ever. It's the you know, but you know that's the stuff that you know we still need to make sure that we we don't bring our biases into the conversation. And why wouldn't you know um, we think about you know diversity in a way that is actually constructive? Um, and so, at a board level, and this is the work that the, uh, you know we've done with the world at the World Economic Forum. Um, you know, the the reason why companies are thinking about gender diversity, gender parity, and really, it's you know the this the three in the in the middle year, right? So you know, there's still there's still companies who are thinking about it from a fairness and an equity perspective, right? Um, but it's really about how is it that we're able to represent our consumer base more and more, right? And and from a decision making uh, power and so uh, and purchasing power perspective, and then talent, right? Uh, becomes so so important. Um, and so when we start to see, we're starting to see women move capital in more weird and wonderful ways. Um, and and there are a couple of interesting markets that are being eradicated because of the rise of uh, the female consumer. And so you'll start to see that globally sedan sales, for example, so in the vehicle in the, in the automotive industry, sedan sales are on a decline. They've been on a decline for a while. And the, you can start to see the direct con correlation between the decline of the sedan and the increase in purchasing power of women in in that industry because women prefer SUVs um, because they are bigger, they are safer. We carry a lot of baggage with us, both emotional, physical, and otherwise. And so we've we've got we need space for all of that in our vehicles. Um, and so we're buying SUVs. We're no longer buying beautiful luxury sedans. Um, and so that market is suddenly becoming eradicated. And and that's the power right here. Um, you know, before in a household, um, typically, uh, and this is very stereotypically um, in developed and developing countries, we would have seen, you know, big purchases like vehicles, um, like electronics, all being made by the male figure in the household. We're not seeing that anymore, right? We're seeing women making really interesting choices and choices on their own. And, and that's how we're seeing this kind of eradication of, um, of entire industries. And for me, that's really what's beautiful around making sure that we have diverse teams, right? Because you can start to see this. You can start to make sure that you have the right kind of mix of people at the design table, um, at the decision making table um, to be able to actually action this. And I've seen this play out in so many different shapes, ways, functions and forms. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that we do besides supporting entrepreneurs is we've got a $30 million venture capital fund that's funding, uh, you know, female innovators across Africa. Um, and when we look at deal flow, we're starting to see, you know, incredible amounts of females come to us and say, you know, male VCs have turned us down. Well, because there's sexual harassment in the industry, which is, you know, in and itself a challenge. But what we're seeing more and more is that they don't understand our product. They don't understand the market opportunity, right? And women are massive market opportunity, they're an entire economy in itself, right? And if, you know, I personally just think about myself, my friend circle, um, uh, I was sharing with um, Len and Christina on the call, um, you know, I, I became a mom for the second time six weeks ago. The amount of um, Amazon boxes that have arrived <laughs> at my house for all sorts of different things, right? Um, 
and and people don't understand that they're like why would you need that right um and and for it and because you don't fundamentally understand women right uh because they from a consumer perspective it means that you're missing out on all that all those dollars that could be coming your way um, because I'm spending so much money on really random things to help make my life easier, right? And that's what we spend on. Women will spend on their families. Women will spend on things that actually reduce um, the the pressure on them. So they're looking at time things, those things that can save me time, things can make my life efficient. Uh, I've, and, and I can tell you, I've bought some... Oh, a, a weird range of, of stuff. My mom came to, to me the other day and she said, what is this? And I said, no, it's a flask that tells the temperature by the press of a button because I need to know exactly what the temperature is, whether it's going to be too hot. I don't have time to go and cool it and hot and make it hot so that, you know, I can make baby bottles because the child is just drinking nonstop, right? Stuff like that. And, and I spend four times the amount I would have on a normal flask. Right? And so, start, so what you're starting to see in product categories as well, you're starting to see higher spend and higher purchases by women because we're thinking about what makes our life easier, right? And I think it's it's culminating in, in being able to think about the user completely differently, right? From a perspective that uh, as a um, as a company. And so here's some some key highlights and 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 the things and the trends that we see globally happen. Um, the world of work has changed. Um, it was it was always changing but it's been exacerbated over the last two years by COVID. We start to see mass exits because people uh, want to work where they want to work from. Today I was actually having a conversation with someone from Sweden who decided to move to Cape Town for the next six months because it's cold in Sweden um, and dark. <laughs> and Cape Town right now is in, you know, peak summer. It's, you know, 28 degrees and sunny outside and we at the coast. So, he, you know, he can work from anywhere and he'd like to work from the beach in Cape Town rather than snowy Sweden. Um, and when companies, and I've met some really interesting, I've met very overly qualified, you know, CTOs and that their, their skills are in, so, in such demand and they're leaving the companies who, who are going to pay them a premium because actually they won't let them work remotely, right? And so that's the kind of interesting things that are happening out in the world, right? Um, it means that your company is not inclusive. Uh, why do you need me to be in the office? And so there's, this, there's a rich debate here to be had around being able to make sure that um, you know, we created a world that is inclusive. Um, besides the the working from the beach in in Cape Town, which I guess is you know I can highly recommend to to anybody who's interested. Um, you know, there are t there's talent out there that have been excluded because we used to make sure that people had to come into an office, right? And so we we're starting to see people who are differently able. Who um, there's an amazing restaurant in Japan where. Um, you know the 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 servers actually robots. Um, that's cool in itself, but um, those robots are controlled by people who are completely paraplegic and 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 are bedridden. And so they're sitting at home in uh, in an apartment. But actually, they we've brought them into society, into mainstream society, in a way that has leveraged technology, right? And we wouldn't be able to do that a couple of years ago, right? And so that's what technology has been able to do for us. Um, and it means that, you know, they, they're able to communicate with people. It means that they def bring a different skill set. And people are not going to that restaurant because of that particular experience. Right? And so what we're starting to see is consumers want experiences. Right? Consumers want experiences that are unique, um, that, um, that are socially, you know, conscious. Um, and so we're starting to see, you know, that and, and suddenly that restaurant's revenue is through the roof. Um, and that's just because they've become inclusive. Uh, we're starting to see skills gaps widening and we're seeing this all over the show. Um, and that's just because, you know, you've got the haves and we've got the have nots. Um, you know, the digital divide becomes wider, um, you know, constantly. We saw this with COVID. We saw people who were, you know, whether COVID happened or not, it didn't matter for them because they could seamlessly move online from an education perspective. But actually those that were not connected in the same way that we, you know, there was connectivity issues, but also the cost of connection was really high with the losers. Um, and so you started to see kids who weren't at school, you know, and we started to, to backtrack on some of those strides, um, you know, for the last two years because they just didn't have access. Um, and and so you, you in any situation, you're going to have winners and you're going to have losers. Right. And so you're starting to see a war on talent and that's because it's global. Um, you're starting to see, you know, because of, you know, the ability for people to work from anywhere. So those companies that are saying, actually, you know, I really don't care where where you do your job from. So whether it's, you know, snowy Sweden or the beach in Cape Town, um, you know, we want the best person for the job. Um, and and 
they able to attract the right kind of skills um and and you're going to see this way more and more and already you know in in every sector that i'm in people are going you know we our, our you know technology skills engineering skills that was scarce before it's going to be even more scarce now and the reason being is is that more industries are actually looking to hire engineering and tech talent right and so for example industries that um that traditionally did not higher engineers or, or, or technical staff need everybody's looking for kind of data scientists um, everybody's you know uh, so the whole nature of companies that didn't require that before currently requiring it now and so everybody's building a tech team um, right if they're not outsourcing that component and so you're starting to see a lot more opportunity out there but also a lot less talent right um, and so you're starting to see a new workforce emerge as well. Um, and, and because it's global, you've, you, you know, you've got opportunities and you've got teams that are able to work remotely. Um, you know, so you've got uh, a project that is being done you know, in, by an engineer in Dubai, as well as somebody in Singapore, and the manager is actually sitting in, in, in Mexico. And, um, and so being able to have that kind of collaboration across um, regions understanding multiculturalism understanding that the differences between different peoples the way and style they operate it's really hard to be in hr is the is the summary of this conversation here yeah, because because talent moving talent and understanding and getting talent is becoming more and more difficult that being said you know um the, the boomers are, are, will, will tell you geez those millennials hey they were so tough to work with just wait until you meet Gen Zs, right? Um, and Gen Zs are a younger generation. They are more conscious. They um, understand what they want out of life in, a, in an interesting way. They have a very different work ethic. And the work ethic is really around serving self, understanding that um, you know, they, they have different needs. Um, and it's been so interesting to see them push companies around areas, especially around kind of mental health and wellness. Um, and so they'll just be like, I'm not happy. I, I'm quitting my job. And it was interesting for us to see the first wave of, of young people who had just started working. Um, and they were like, we just gonna quit because we're just not happy here. Um, and you're like, what do you mean you're just not happy here? It's a, it's a job, you've got to work your way up. Uh, and, and so how do you, how do you work in a, how do you get who will leave because they're just not happy? Um, and so this idea of happiness, what is happiness? What does happiness at work look like? Are you supposed to be happy at work? Um, right, is, is questions that companies are gonna be grappling with, right? Um, but, it, and, and it's part of about, you know, are they not happy because the environment is not inclusive, right? Um, you know, are they not happy? So, and what is it? And fundamentally, we need to start to think about, rethink about what does this work environment look like, right? We're starting to move away from, you know, um, you know, I studied, I got my degree and that's it. You know, we're moving towards kind of modularized lifelong learning. Um, you know, we saw, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, there's a big conference happening in Cape Town with the Global Dean's Council. So there's engineering um, faculties, uh, head of departments from around the world in Cape Town and got to speak to them the other day. And this idea of micro-credentialing, moving away from these kind of large, you know, big, very expensive degrees from, you know, universities to actually, you know, working and cre credentialing, working, credentialing, working, credentialing, working. Um, and it means that the cost for you know a premium education is actually reduced because you're not spending four to six years at a, at a tertiary institution it also means that tertiary institutions are being disrupted in, a, in an interesting way um, and 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 then you start to go you know with the idea of micro credentialing and working and and experience hiring for the job um, uh, and, and we're starting to see a shift from hiring just from a job and what that job role is and the job spec to hiring for adaptive capabilities. Um, and my company did that. We, we actually said, um, go and find out what we do as a company and you send us a 30 second video of how your skills can be applied. Um, and it doesn't matter what your background is. We don't need engineers. We don't need this. We, don't, we just need people who are adaptive. And literally every person who emailed us to say, we love your company, could you please send us a job skeptic? We said, you can't work for us, right? Because we actually need you to be really adaptive. If you're asking me for a job description right now, we don't actually want, we need somebody who's flexible, right? Um, and we call this cognitive agility, right? And so what we're seeing more and more is, is that we need to find workforce that is, that the ability to be able to stretch themselves cognitively into new spaces, the ability to learn something, unlearn it because, you know, the half-life 
of knowledge is five years now. It means that within five years, whatever you learned five years ago is probably irrelevant because the industry is moving so fast, right? Um, and you need to relearn and unlearn and relearn. Um, and so if you can't do that, I mean, there's a, a, a futurist who has famously said the illiterate of the 21st century isn't going to be those that can't read and write. It's going to be those that don't have the ability to learn and learn and relearn. Right? Um, and so that becomes really important when thinking about how is it that we bring diverse people in, how we train people, how they're able to um, work in different environments. Um, you know, and you know, I'd be remiss in talking about you know gender parity and, and gender uh, in in our environments because largely we've overlooked. Um, 50% of the population and specifically in engineering in some of our markets where you know female engineering talent make up 10 to 20% of your engineering talent. Um, what we've seen in the engineering space specifically so for example and I'll give you two really interesting examples one was in the mining industry uh, which we work with um, and you know those big dumper trucks they are absolutely massive on mine sites. Um, what they found was that female drivers um, cost the company less because their maintenance was lower, they drove more carefully, so there were fewer accidents, and because they were driving more carefully, their fuel cost was lower. Now, can you imagine in a, in, in a global energy crisis that we're currently in right now, suddenly the company's going, we'd like to recruit more female drivers because the data is now there that female drivers are better than men, finally, right? Um, and so um, we've, we, we now have conclusive, conclusive evidence uh, that women are better drivers. Um, and, and, and for us, that's really interesting to be able to say, you know, we've excluded women as drivers of these massive daft trucks. We don't actually need the physical strength to drive it, right? It's a machine. We, you know, we, we move it around. We don't need to be physically, you know, the, the, the physical strength that you needed before. Um, and, and so that's been really interesting. And then the second one is, is around, um, you know, in one of our clients who, who works, um, they, a, a mechanical engineering company, um, and they told us, you know, they prefer female engineers because one, they want more meticulous, um, they make less errors, um, and they're willing to work so much harder. Um, and the reason is, is that the opportunities for women in the space is so limited that when women do get the opportunity, they're always giving 150%. And I always have a fundamental problem with that because I'm like, are you paying them for 150% that they're giving, right? And he's like, no, 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 but I'm getting 150% of value right here. Um, and I'm going, I feel like you should pay them for the 150%. But it just shows, you know, that kind of that the work ethic is, is fundamentally different. Um, and that's how we've, you know, got to really rethink the way in which we attract talent, um, thinking about the inclusivity and thinking about how is it that we ch strictly change the way in which we, we, we do business. And, and so, you know, you go, Nadia, you said a lot, there's a lot here, um, you know, how, um, and again, you know, clearly I've, uh, I've got a, uh, I've got a thing for, for Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, and, and it's really around, um, and actually I have met him, and uh, you'll see this pink hard hat behind me. We've got a campaign to empower 1 million girls through STEM education. Um, and I met him at the World Economic Forum and I said, you know, Prime Minister, would you take a picture with me in this hard hat um, to support this campaign? And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll wear the hard hat in the picture. And I was just like, but your hair's going to get ruined. Your hair. <laughs> right? And he was just like, no problem. I was like, you know, um, hard hat head is a, is a real thing. Uh, but it's, you know, uh, you know, some of the other things is, is it, you know, being a leader, it means that you've, you've got the, you've got the responsibility um, to extend that to everybody. And, um, and I'm going to quote Aunt May from Spider-Man, um, you know, because with great power does come great responsibility, right? And so as leaders in, in the industries that we're in, we have the responsibility to bring everybody with us. Um, and so what does winning look like? Um, you know, and, and these are some key things that we've taken away on actually how to make diversity, equity and inclusion really work in our industry. The one is you need both a bottom up and a top down approach. The bottom up, um, is, is that you've got diverse talent coming in, understanding that, you know, talent is requiring different things. So in the engineering industry, we fundamentally have to rethink the spaces in which women operated in. I've worked on, you know, construction sites as well as in offices where there just wasn't enough female bathrooms. So, you know, some basics. Um, uh, I remember uh, we were hosting the 20, because it's World Cup. Uh, it just, it makes me nostalgic. So South Africa hosted the 2010 FIFA World Cup and I was uh, responsible for uh, VIP transport operations. But prior to that, I was on a stadium building um, 
one of the training stadiums and I literally had to cross the road to go to a, to a, a KFC bathroom because they didn't have female bathrooms on site right and it was a really busy highway just to go to the bathroom right and so you know how is it that we're able to structurally change the landscape for women to operate and thrive and make sure that there's a bathroom or enough bathrooms close by, right? Um, and so it means, you know, bringing in the talent in, but at a top down, making sure that we, that this is part of our mandate, that it's not just a tick box exercise, that we don't have the gender washing, right? The visibility piece is key, right? And, um, you know, I've got a theory called the 20% tipping point. And I saw this with a number of movements. You saw this with Me Too, where women in Silicon Valley were only, feeling safe to speak out about sexual harassment when women made up about 20% in the tech industry. We saw this in the same as the film and media industry where women directors were about 20%, women started talking up, you know, speaking out about, you know, um, you know, sexual harassment in the industry. When women make up more than 20%, they, they're able to speak out because they feel that they have the confidence and they have the support structure when they do speak out, um, that it's not something what we call the career limiting moves. Um, you know, and so the visibility of women and other women in the industry, other people who are diverse, is really important, especially at a com and at your company level, right? And not just you know uh, being poster children, but actually being able to make sure that those people are remunerated in the correct way, that they are seen, that they have both not just the title and the credentials, but also the opportunities that come with that, right? Um, we're starting to see, you know, one of the, the really powerful things is really the power of storytelling and narratives here, right? Especially for companies who are looking to make sure that they attract a customer who is way more socially conscious than we've ever been um, and will remain that, especially for Gen Zs. You know, everybody talks about mentorship and mentorship is really important. Mentorship and reverse mentorship. Um, but actually what is more critical is championing, right? And so, um, you know, on, on the continent, we have something called a praise singer. Um, and very quickly, so praise singer is before president comes out or, you know, a, a leader comes out, um, the praise singer comes on board and goes, uh, and actually Lynn was basically my praise singer. She came out and she told everybody how wonderful I was um, and set the expectation that you were going to be meeting a person of stature, right? Um, and so everybody's like, oh, I've got to listen to Nadia because Lynn said all these wonderful things about her. And that's really important in industry, right? Especially for candidates who are coming from a diverse background is, is that we need to champion them, um, especially in spaces where they are on the back foot naturally coming into, into the working world and the working environment, right? Um, what we're seeing more and more is, is that companies have great policies um, so we've got a diversity and inclusion policy. Everybody's really proud of the policy, but actually, is it the lived experience of everybody? Yes, you're diverse. Are you inclusive? Right. Um, and then thinking about this from a triple bottom line perspective, right? And um, more importantly, that you're starting to see that this actually has the opportunity to create higher profits and higher return on investment um, more than anything else. Um, and so you know, the winning formula is, is that companies need to take a long term vision around diversity, equity and inclusion. It's not going to happen overnight, especially if you don't cultivate these talent pipelines early on. You've got commitment, right, um, and resources. And uh, and when we talk about commitment and resources, we mean to put money um, at this, right, to be able to, to do this. And uh, I had a, a, one of the largest um, you know, farming and equipment companies come to me and say, you know, Nadia, we, we really are struggling with diversity and inclusion in our business. We have very few female sales managers. We've got very few women in the technical side. We're doing really badly at this. You know, can you help us? And I said, sure. And, they, and, and that I had an out of office because I was actually in holiday in Turkey. And they said to me, um, you know, she, had, she called me because she because I said, you know, if this is urgent, please call. And uh, I said, okay, cool, let's set up a call next week. And I, on the call, I'm like, okay, great. You know, this is what we could do. What's your budget? And she said, no, we don't have a budget. We've got this volunteer team who are looking at, you know, diversity pieces within our business. And I said, call me when you have a budget because this takes money. It takes, and I said, who are the leaders who are gonna be championing this? Who's gonna sign a check for this internally? Who's planning this? And until you don't have this, you know, it's not gonna happen. And so those great, committees that are, you know, great volunteers who are doing the most, they can't do the most if it's not part of their performance reviews and recognized as such, right? And so they're doing all this extra work 
Um, and you know, the, there's, there's a stat that says that um, women have uh, eight hours of extra work on their day. And you go, how is that? This is the kind of thing that adds extra work that's not remunerated, um, right? And so unless you have these kinds of pieces, you actually don't, the winning formula starts to kind of frazzle out. Um, and so making sure that it's part of their performance review, that they are remunerated for it, that there is a budget for it, and that you're, you're planning for it, and that there is a leader um, that completely believes in, in this vision, right? Um, and so, you know, when we think about diversity and inclusion, it's really about making sure that we bring and give human dignity to everybody, that it's our differences that, that really matter, that make us special. Um, and so, you know, specifically on the, on the, on, on, from a gender perspective, you know, people, you know, they've been doing a lot of studies, especially in engineering, and you start to see a lot of women leaving the industry within the first five years. And uh, when I ask people, well, why do you think women are leaving? And they go, oh, no, they, they're going to have kids. And that's why they're leaving. Um, and actually, they're leaving because you're just not paying them enough. You're not paying them equally, and they find this out. And because they've got extra work added, that eight hours is, is a real issue. Um, and because they're on all the committees uh, to make sure that there's wellness within the company, um, that they're taken care of, that everybody's taken care of, that's over and above their day jobs, that isn't recognized in a performance review. So how do we make sure that women specifically come into our sectors from a talent perspective? We attract them you know, into these exciting careers. We pay them equally. Um, we train and develop them so it's not just window dressing. Um, we value the full value chain of their contributions um, and, and we really create that inclusive environment for them to be able to speak up, to be able to make sure. And, and when we talk about inclusive environments, both, you know, the, um, the emotional environment, the, um, the, uh, the physical, you know, do we have bathrooms, you know, enough bathrooms for, for, for women um, within our company. Um, and, uh, you know, this is kind of my parting shot, because whenever I talk about the money discussion, people go, oh, but, you know, what if we, you know, we invest all this money and, and then they leave us, right? And, you know, but what if they stay? And we start to see a lot more from a, a loyalty perspective. Company loyalty is changing over time. You know, we, start, we saw boomers who would go and, and work at a company and they'd work for their entire life and they would retire nicely. Um, you know, we're seeing millennials who will change their jobs um, you know, a couple of times, um, but you're starting to see Gen Zs and, and kind of the, the last kind of lot of millennials who are changing careers. And so the World Economic Forum, you know, they say that you'll change careers at least, you know, five times. I'm, I think on my like seventh career change, I'm already the anomaly, but what I'm, I'm, I may be the anomaly in the millennial category, but in the Gen Z category, I'm, I'm spot on. But what we must recognize now is, is the diversity of skill set becomes invaluable. And what we're seeing is a cross-pollination of being able to, to work together in other industries. And the, the, the parting shot is we worked with uh, on a really exciting project on high-performing teams. And it was ourselves um, being able to be a, a leadership and talent provider. Um, the Williams Martini racing team and uh, the FMC, and our, our part is one of the largest FMCG companies in the world. And you went, you know, what is a company who makes soap powder know about Formula One racing and us, right, and, 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 and gender. And it was about how is it that we could cross pollinate across, you know, different industries to bring in the best thought leadership, to be able to bring in the best skill set and what you can learn about. And, and actually, um, if you look at a pit stop and how quickly and how precise you have to be, you know, and you bring that kind of precision into your manufacturing environment, what is the cost reduction um, on on those processes, right, and, and the optimization opportunity, right there. And so there's actually a lot to be learned between different industries. And so when you've got people who are career shifting, they're bringing all that knowledge and wisdom with you. Um, and so I've said a lot. Um, that was a, a, a you know a, a, a very tumultuous conversation. But the parting shot here is is that diversity, equity, and inclusion is not just the right thing to do but from a, an equity perspective, but actually from an opportunity perspective to be able to make sure that companies will last beyond every disruption that we have that gets thrown. Um, uh, that, that gets thrown. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have time just for one question and it's actually is from David Sol. Um, let me, you wanna, it's in the chat, you wanna read it or you want me to read it? 
if you want to read it, it's great. Thank you, and thank you, Nadia. Oh, it's always great to just get from the, in, in English, we have a saying that says, you know, you get it from the horse's mouth. It's a terrible saying, uh, but we'd you know, love to hear another voice here. So please do ask your question in, in kind of real time. Uh, okay. I have been worried about making a business case for inclusion because I have seen changes in legislation, in society, even in developed societies, even in advanced societies that restrict rights from minorities. So what happens if in the future, in 10, 20 years, God doesn't will? It makes sense in an economic standpoint to be less inclusive or to discriminate against some minorities. If I'm worried that if we do that, uh, pitch to a business that do it because it helps your bottom line, it can backfire in the future. And, and, and it's an interesting question. And, um, you know, uh, David, and I think that, that the challenge is, is that we've always said, you know, that we've always used the equity conversation, right? So we've got to make sure that we include minorities, people from different backgrounds and orientations. But unfortunately, that hasn't worked. You know, it has the, the we haven't moved the needle fast enough in terms of progress on, on diversity, equity, inclusion. But the minute you see, and, and it's how do you make the case completely and comprehensively so that people can understand and for the market that you're speaking to. So when we're speaking to governments, it's about making sure that, you know, from a citizen perspective, that all citizens have the opportunity. And we start to talk about social unrest and, 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 and how we treat minorities, etc. When we speak to the business community, and this one is specifically really, uh, we've seen the, the value add from a business perspective, is while corporates do have the mandate to be, you know, socially responsible, and they're being held to a standard of social responsibility, of, you know, via social media and via the public, um, things only move quickly within a corporate when there's an economic imperative to do so and so suddenly when you're changing this conversation you're starting to see you know shifts in in the why um and moving uh, and and actually having resources mobilized towards this um and hopefully this doesn't change in the future with we, what we're seeing the trend is, is that it will continue because we're moving all to multicultural you know um, industries i see people's names and surnames now and i go oh are you from you know you know, if you look at my name, for example, right, and you go, oh, you're Nadia Musaji, you, you know, uh, originally my, my, my great grandfather's from India, um, and my other great grandfather's from like somewhere in like the Asian side, and then there's somebody who's got French blood or whatever. And because we are multicultural now, that kind of thing will perpetuate. And so hopefully we start to see that minorities get integrated and you're starting to see a lot more tolerant society. Um, what we are seeing is the backlash from nationalism and that's in a political agenda, right? And, and, and that is actually just fear-based, right? So it's fear-based that, um, you know, I'm losing my identity as a, particular, as a particular thing and this is why I need the borders and this is why I need the identity tied to that. But the younger generation, the Gen Zs, they, you know, they'd gladly give up their passports to become kids of the world and just kind of float around in this. And this is why, you know, things like the metaverse is so appealing because you don't have to have a passport to, to move to borders. You can connect with anybody around the world. And so it's really about how is it that we frame the value add to make sure that from a corporate perspective, companies actually buy into, into this because ultimately what the CEO is going to tell me is, is that this is great, but my shareholders um, require value. <laughs> Thank you. I'm feeling like I'm more cynical and pessimistic than you. <laughs> I don't think most CEOs have a moral imperative to do the right thing. No, exactly. And that's why we have to give them the financial imperative to do so. <laughs> that worries me a lot. But thank you very much. Great talk. Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much for your comments, David. Thank you so much, Nadia. You gave us such a wealth of information. I mean, on the on the business case, right, of, of diversity and also like the power of inclusivity when you really take time to, um, you know, I think really incorporate 
you know, that diverse talent into your team and listen and make sure that 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 diverse team can really bring themselves to to business solutions and bring that creativity and and the, the real innovation. So I, uh, you, you've said so many great things and we really appreciate you being here with us today. And again, taking time away from your new baby and congratulations on that. Uh, thanks so much. An, an absolute pleasure. And yeah, um, you know, I hope that this has given a food for thought and a couple of nuggets and, uh, and any takeaway. So, um, you know, hopefully we move in a, in a world then that we're able to leverage diversity, equity and inclusion for, for the positive um, and to, to kind of help settle poor, poor David's fears uh, around the negative externalities. Yeah, let's um, let's work together. I think it's a collective uh, effort. But thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. What, a, what an honor to have you speak with us and um, good luck with all your various endeavors. Keep keep at it is what I would say. You're making a tremendous impact on the world, really. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Have a great off. Well, a great day further. <laughs> Take thanks, care. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.